Jackal Among Snakes Author, Nemorosus, Chapter 201, Conflict in Paradise Annalise felt as though she had returned to the invasion of Berenda, where she stood at the helm of a Veiden longship leading men towards a great throng of foes defending their homeland. There was nervousness, anticipation, and a dim hum of fear beneath it all, larger and stronger and more consistent than any feeling. This was war, she felt, and the stakes went far beyond merely her life. She stayed calm despite these sensations aided by her own nature and the enchanted items our grave had given her. The wax knights marched ahead of Durin and her, armor clanging against the granite path beneath them. They fearlessly cut their way towards the legion of monstrosities ahead. Leopards with the heads of cobras shot out their fangs as poison projectiles, while badger-like creatures flapped their wings, ready to assail them from the sky. Laughter cut above all the sounds, Durin's, she knew. The man usually had a haze of cynical depression at most times, but in life or death battle, he came alive. The bard is the passive one. Argrave's voice rang in her head. If you attack him, he'll remain level-headed. He won't attack you immediately. He'll do nothing but hold you back, using his own men while he aids them passively and waits for reinforcements. Sylvic will be interfering with his abilities, so it shouldn't be as deadly as it normally is. Annalise could see the bard in the back. The bare-faced bard, Argrave had dubbed him. He was a wetland spirit, the same as Sylvic, though more massive than the other they'd seen standing at perhaps ten feet. His head was like a spearhead, though unlike Sylvic or the intrepid Troubadour, it had a face of flesh. It was a child's face, pale and smooth, and jarringly placed amidst wood so unnaturally it seemed to be painted on. Its eyes were closed, as though it were dead. The wax knights charged into the horde of unnatural sentinels with practiced deadliness. The reason that Orion had insisted on bringing those of his knights that were also mages became obvious. They became a storm of spell and sword that made their charge increase in devastation tenfold as fire, ice, lightning, and the earth tore through the battlefield. Their charge cut through the bare-faced bard's retinue with seeming ease for a time. The strange hybrid animals fell one after the other before effective attacks could be made. But the bard placed his hands against the ground, and his childlike face came to life, eyes opening to reveal empty sockets. He began to sing. The elaborate gardens of the palace became animate, the hedges and trees contorting in impossible manners to assail and obstruct their rush. Much of the granite pathway was turned over as roots bit at the wax knight's feet. Step back. Annalise shouted using her commander's voice again after so long, as had been agreed before the assault. The wax knights obeyed her orders. They retreated slightly, tangling with the bard's assault of greenery. As if on cue, the sentinels began a countercharge. The true heavy hitters of the opponent revealing themselves in earnest. A giant python twice as thick as a man's torso lunged out, seemingly seeking to swallow the knight's whole. A squad of gibbons rushed out, swinging so quickly from hidden places it was shocking. Conserve your magic. Considering how many opponents you're dealing with, big B rank spells are best. So whenever you feel it's prudent, use that B-rank spell you used in the Mard Hallowed Grounds. You know, with the twin ice blades, Argrave's voice echoed like a reminder. And she did. She advanced past the retreating wax knights, towards the lunging pythons gaping more, and conjured the B-rank matrix for ice-bound twin blades. Two blades of ice appeared before her, each held by a set of frozen arms attached at the shoulder, and each taller than her. The python's jaw caught on one blade but the two arms braced themselves undisturbed. When the blades of ice began spinning and moving forth, the python was ripped free from the wall it clung to. It hung on for but a second before releasing its bite. It slammed against the outer wall of the palace, dislodging a gargantuan statue that toppled down, killing the giant python and several other creatures. All the while, there, ice-bound twin blades, cut through countless foes before her. Annalise staggered from the powerful spell, and when the icy mist settled, her gaze locked with the bare-faced bard's empty eye sockets. A chill ran through her. Routes surged up out of the ground, grabbing at both of her legs. She was pulled into oncoming enemies, yet resisted stubbornly. Just then, Durant stepped past. He cast a simple flame spell then stabbed his glaive eye through it, and the unique properties of the wyvern bone carried the spell with the attack. Durant cleanly severed the attacking roots. She was freed. Conserve your magic, Annalise, Durant reminded her. She could practically hear his grin through his grey wyvern scale helmet. And good job. Grateful to him. She stepped back, commanding the wax knights to advance once more. As she retreated behind them, she looked into the far distance. There, she saw an overwhelming presence approaching them all too quickly. The jungle is aggressive and foolhardy. I have no doubt he'll rush towards you blindly as soon as he figures out that the bard is under assault. Argrave's words came to her. The jolly jungle, as Argrave had called him, did not match his description particularly well. It was an ape, kin to the gibbons that had assaulted them during their journey through the wetlands. It was giant, though and white. It ran atop the triangular rooftops of the buildings within the palace. As though balancing on a tightrope, its arms as thick and long as the titanic python she'd just slain. It held a true sword in its right hand, and though the blade was thick, black, and crude, the liquid light teeming on its surface told of its true power.
The jungle tore a spike off the tip of one of the roofs and threw it towards Annalise with astounding ferocity. She barely had the time to use her ring to conjure a B-rank ward, and even the ward barely stopped the projectile. She dared a glance to where our grave waited, but the way light fell made her unable to see beyond the window. It's up to him, then, Annalise noted mentally. Hash. Our grave watched the jolly jungle prance about the rooftops erratically. His head was swimming in pain and he felt such an intense power in his fingertips it felt as though he was holding back the ocean. Even now, blood danced from his fingers, his eyes, his nose, his ears, all fueling the spell in his hands. Behind, Gulliman and his brumasiners dealt with what few foes entered the buildings. Come on, you fucker. Land, Argrave muttered. There, Bloodfud bow, had grown in volume and intensity so much it was astounding. The air around Argrave was filled with a dark red mist so faint it was barely noticeable. Dust and air swirled about from the tip of the bloody arrow, which had grown larger than his arm. As if answering his prayers, the ape vaulted over one of the rooftops and landed in the center of the pathway, rushing towards Annalise and her party with an intense ferocity. Once it passed by the pink flower above the hedges, it was as though a trap had been sprung. Routes exploded upwards, and the jungle howled in primal surprise as they curled around him, ensnaring him. Triumph and nervousness filled our grave so intensely his head grew light. He tried to aim as best he could but the emotions made his head dance. He fell to one knee, his vision only whiteness. When the ringing settled and his vision cleared, the jungle thrashed about, breaking free of its snare. Argrave felt a complete dread as the monkey wrenched free its gargantuan crude sword out of the trap and rushed towards Annalise. He followed it with a bow, shaking as he stood on one knee. He saw its legs brace, and his focus intensified to a ridiculous degree. He raised the bow upwards, howling in agony as his body protested. The monkey jumped up into the air, sword held above its head. Argrave released the power he'd been holding in his right hand and finished casting, Bloodfud bow. The dark red arrow head tore through the bay window, the wall, and passed through the sky so quickly it was not all visible. It was a streak of crimson that spurred intense winds as it traveled, and the hedges close and distant both blew, shaken by the intense power. Argrave did not see the arrow hit the jungle, but the arrow did hit the jungle. It had to have done so, elsewise the gaping hole in his chest and his missing head were quite the coincidence. The jungle's body spun about wildly from the tremendous force the sword still held in hand. It twisted through the air, falling atop the wax knights and sentinels both as they fought. The jungle landed in the middle of the battle, like a statement to their foes. Our grave gasped, half a laugh and half a groan of pain. He tried to rise to his feet, ready to shout, time for a blessing. He quickly found rising to his feet was a mistake. His vision went white once again, his hearing vanished. And soon, the white was replaced by blackness. He felt his feet leave the ground, his head leaning forward. Hash. Annalise gazed upon the corpse of the jolly jungle. His hands were near as large as she was, and still clung to the sword it held. Much of its torso and all of its head had simply vanished, transformed into naught but a fine red mist, still scattering across the battlefield even now. She felt a fool, but glanced back to where the shot had come from. She found she was not a fool rather quickly, as our grave tumbled off the gaping hole in the wall, body limp and unconscious, her mind very nearly shut down as she juggled variables. She was the commander of the battle, the bare-faced bird was behind her, Yet Argrave had planned to use the blessing of supersession, and he's unconscious and could be vulnerable, all these thoughts came so quickly. When she saw Gilliman jump down from the hole in the wall and coming to Argrave's side, she felt immeasurable relief. She spared a glance back towards the wax knights and Ren, then said, step back. Once again, Sylvic, full attention. With that last order given, she ran towards Argrave in a panic far unlike what she was used to experiencing. When she neared, she slid towards him recklessly. Gilliman already attempted to rouse him shaking him lightly but intently. Don't shake him. She scolded, yet felt a fool not moments after, she merely did not wish to see him hurt. Gulliman stood and said, I will guard. His eyes blinked open, unfocused, and she felt immeasurable relief. Trying her best to remain calm, she scanned his body for injuries. His armor had scuffs on it, likely preventing genuine harm from the fall. One shot, she heard him mutter. Air shot, one shot. He giggled deliriously. Annalise used the B-rank healing spell, bounteous vitality an all-purpose general heal that might solve some issues, even if it did nothing for the loss of blood. It seemed to have an immediate effect. His blinking lost its drowsy nature, and his black and gold eyes regained sharpness. You're okay, you're okay, she insisted, hoping to all she held dear it was true. He looked at her, confused. When Gilliman slew something behind them, he shouted, Christ! And sat up quickly. Annalise wished to tell him he should take it easy, ensure he was not harmed. Yet she knew she could not say that. Instead, she stood and pulled him to his feet. Behind. Sylvic stepped free from where she had been hiding, moving to aid the wax knights and Ren, who fell back even still. We move, she grabbed his arm. Argrave looked to the battle ahead, clutching his head in pain and trying to retain his balance. She supported him. He looked around. Though the jolly jungle was dead, his servants began to catch up with him, 
and the battle with the bare-faced bard was not yet won, still got work to do, looks like, he concluded. Chapter 202, done enough. Argrave felt a fog within all of his body. His actions were stiff and vague as though he had just been thawed out after being frozen for years. He could barely focus on the task at hand, and even keeping his head held up was difficult. All he wanted to do was go to sleep. But he'd long ago set aside what he wanted. This was about what needed to be done. Kill the enemy, kill the enemy, kill the enemy he repeated again and again, half of the time saying it aloud, and the other half saying it in his head. It was the only way he could stay focused on the task before him. He felt as though he was fumbling for a light switch while drunk as he tried to recall how to use the blessing of supersession. Yet once he felt the spring of limitless power vested in him by Earl of permeate his being. He felt like a dull knife that had finally found a whetstone, and everything fell into place. His vision sharpened, and his ears felt as though earplugs had been removed from them. His golden-eyed gaze fell upon the scene before him, and he straightened, now aware Annalise had been the only reason Argrave was standing up. The wax knights, alongside Drun, struggled against a tide of vicious sentinels and supporting animals. More had joined since Argrave last saw them, the towering rock-eyed hippos, the gibbons in no small numbers. Now, the bare-faced bard fought directly against Sylvic, their war a proxy battle of twisting roots and writhing plants. Sylvic was losing, and badly, Argrave straightened his back and held out both of his hands. Sword and shield he remembered, sword and shield. His right hand conjured, electric eels, and the C-rank spells danced upwards into the sky. Awaiting his command, his left became ablaze with wide, sweeping spells that carved a path before him. He pressed deeper and deeper into the thick of things, adrenaline keeping his mind utterly focused despite his aching mind and body. He never wanted for foes, their rush at him was unending, and even though the animals feared him, they charged. He called upon every resource, using Garm's eyes to cast spells with abandon. He felt he could not stop walking forward strangely, guard the back, reinforcements approach. He heard Annalise command, that meant she had confidence he alone was enough to handle all before him, that stuck in the back of his head, making his task seem all the more urgent, teeth, claw, fang, and nature itself sought to tear into our grave's throat and end him, drawing upon instinct, he met them with teeth and claw of his own, he conjured great moors of flame from, warg fire, the icy claws of, wraith's grasp, thick, wind-swept blades, cutting through them all, the enemies were blasted away, some dying outright. Those that did not die met his sword, dozens of, electric eels, striking from the sky like lightning, dispatching any hardy foes. Argrave felt like he could not stop, he felt as though he held on to a machine that was running wild, and that if he released it, it would spell his death. He felt ash beneath his boots, frozen corpses, and the faint shock of still sparking electricity, yet still he pressed. At some point, his vision became a mix of so many lights. He questioned if he was still in the Archduke's palace, yet then, the bare-faced bard came into his view. The former wetland spirit towered over him, and yet it was the one shying away from him, childlike but eyeless face looking as though it was going to cry. It regarded him like a hedgehog, a puff of fish, or a burning flame, backing away cautiously. Yet like a cat hunting a scorpion, it swung out its hands, giving testing blows. Argrave moved to the side, and the bare-faced bard moved opposite him, the two circling each other. In truth, Argrave merely wished to have his back to the wall so that no foes could circle around him. All the while, he warded his foes away still using his tried and true strategy, a sword and shield. He was an indomitable giant of a knight. He told himself. The bare-faced bard climbed the wall of the Archduke's palace, almost in a panic. It sought refuge behind a tower. As it fled, our graves, electric eels, grew all the more numerous in the sky, and the attacking force grew demoralized from their leader's retreat. Sylvic, who was badly beaten from doing battle with a bare-faced bard, did not remain idle. She assaulted the bard even still staying his retreat. As the number of sparking eels neared the hundreds, Argrave's blessing wore out. His shield of wide, sweeping spells faltered as the limitless magic within dissipated. Yet his sword persisted still. He spurred the electric eels, and the countless sparking constructs pursued the bare-faced bard as was his will. The bolts of lightning rained down upon the childlike face embedded in the bard's wooden body. The attacks were relentless and seemingly unceasing, and the bard became a great glow of light before emerging changed, naught but a smoking pile of wreckage. The bard still lived, yet barely, it tumbled over the wall, falling in the courtyard while scrabbling desperately to move. Sylvic disentangled her roots from the ground and sprinted across the badly destroyed granite pathway. Her hand morphed into a spike, and she put an end to the bare-faced bard, plunging her arm right into the childlike face. Argrave leaned against a wall, all fight lost. His foes, unaware of their commander's death, rushed at him. All Argrave could do was curl up relying on his enchanted duster to shield him while protecting his neck and his head. Blows and bites and scratches rained upon him, and pain assailed every part of his body. It never overwhelmed him, though, as much as he waited for it to end. Gradually, the sensation faded. He was vaguely aware of people trying to move him, help him. They received blows in his stead. Nevertheless, 
He faded away. I've done enough. Everyone else can handle the rest? He thought, happily embracing the grayness. Hash. Orion stepped upon a purple velvet carpet, walking down the center of it. In stark contrast to all that was around him in the palace, his steps left dirt and the mud tracking, and he appeared to be the filthy thing in this palace amidst the wetlands. The throne room was a vast place, held up by six thick pillars of black marble veined with gold. Black and gold filled the room with abundance, so much so it was difficult to refrain from calling it gaudy. Black sconces held golden flames. The black walls were trimmed with gold, and even the stained glass windows had been stained gold. It was a decadent place, yet had a grim air to it nonetheless. Banners hung from the walls just beside the windows. The field was black, and it depicted a golden snake. It was not the banner of the royal family, though. This golden snake curled round nothing and stood before a shield. Orion recognized it as the personal sigil of his uncle, the Archduke Regine. At the end of the velvet carpet where the stairs moved up to the throne room, there was a majestic golden stag, with shining antlers stretching up ten feet into the air. It lied on the floor, legs collapsed beneath it and snout against the ground, eyes dead and lifeless. Its antlers had perfect symmetry, forming a strange, webbed pattern. A woman sat atop the stag's head, its snout seeming a perfect seat, its antlers a perfect throne. Her skin was the light green color of the swamp folk, and her eyes a rich and piercingly light yellow. She wore a motley outfit of a dark purple contrasted with a lighter purple. A large jester's hat rested above her brow, three points poking out the top like a half-star. Golden rings hung at the end of these points, half a dozen bells on each ring. One leg was crossed over the other on her stag throne. She held a scepter with a miniature version of her face wrought of silver, hat and all, smiling brightly as it dangled from the loose grip of her left hand. If you've come seeking the Lord, the plague jester began in a sneering act, I am afraid he is rather busy, considering everyone else is either dead or in a similar state, I happen to be the regent of this archduchy, funny thing, a fool being named regent, my favorite jest, and that's speaking as a jester, nevertheless, I've kept the place well maintained, just beyond the stag, where the stairs rose up, three thrones stood, one held the archduke, his body so well preserved he seemed alive, the other held his wife. Orion vaguely remembered the blonde woman but could not recall her name. The Archduke's son sat in the third throne. They all sat upright like they were alive, but were so unmoving they could not be. Orion pointed his mace. Will you repent, plague jester, and kill yourself? The jester laughed. She had a fast paced, wry giggle that sounded fake. Only a fool would do that, thought a different sort of fool than the one you people made me. Why do you point a mace? It is not a sword, and can. Orion threw his mace, and it traveled through the air incredibly quickly. The jester uncrossed her legs kicking the bottom of the fast-moving projectile and sending it upwards into the air, whereupon it fell into her right hand. I'm glad you came, Sianna Vaska, the jester said, voice smooth and calm. Her tittering jester's act dropped entirely. One side of feet you, I will put you beside your kin. They're alive, you know. Well, alive enough to understand things, at the very least. You, the Archduke, all of those outside, all of you will watch as your kingdom and its people rot away turned as ugly outside as they are within. You will despair for decades, as I had. The gods will be the judge of that, Orion declared, entirely unaffected. Yet your god lies beneath your feet, sapped and drained by your antics. You are no faithful, and you have no righteous cause. You are an abomination, and the whole world wishes you dead. Just as I wish the world dead, the jester rebutted, tossing aside Orion's mace. The plague jester rose to her feet, stepping off the stag's head. Bells on her jester's hat and her pointed shoes rang as she moved chimes echoing against the empty marble walls. She was half the height of Orion, yet she did not seem smaller at all. They say the one who grows irate to the jester's jests is the biggest fool of all, she noted, holding her scepter out as she strutted forward, ringing and chiming. Orion rushed forth, far too fast for one armored in metal, and the plague jester let out another fake laugh before preparing to fight. Chapter 203, Fight of the Fools. Here he is, said Dron, his breathing heavy. He handed our grave off to Gilliman, his body limp, lighter than he looks. They were in the small house our grave had been holed up in. His brimasoners stayed by his side, protecting him by shrouding the environment with their mist. Because he has little blood, Glimmon concluded. You. He looked down at Darren's hands. His left hand was covered in blood and seemed misshapen. Just a few fingers gone, Darren laughed, though his voice was tense and betrayed his pain. He gazed at his hand, the middle, ring, and pinky finger were all gone, torn off by a bite. Someone had to save him. Couldn't trust the wax knights. A few fingers is a small price. In my eyes, he's quite the scary one, looks like. Conjured that magic show, his gaze lingered on Argrave, who looked half a corpse. He had countless cuts, yet they did not bleed. Glimmon looked at Dren, judging. Eventually, he nodded. Rejoin the fight, he directed. I will ensure Argrave is safe. Dren nodded. He ran outside, grabbing his clay eye. He cast healing magic on his hand, though the fingers did not regrow, the wound did close. He awkwardly handled his clay eye, 
possessing considerably less grace than he typically did. Annalise strode towards Drin. She looked a mess, her wild and unruly, enchanted armor damaged in half a dozen places. Yet her steps were strong and decisive. How is he? Gilliman is keeping him safe, Durin assured her at once. She did not seem quite relieved, yet Annalise contented herself with that. That centaur has returned with reinforcements, she informed him curtly. You are needed. Argrave gave you command, he reminded her. I know this. And I have a plan, Annalise nodded. The bulk of the forces within the palace are rooted. Not dead, mind you. I suspect they will join up with the host approaching the palace alongside the centaur. They acted reasonably, meaning another one of the fortress commanders is with them commanding them. How many got away, do you think? He questioned, looking around. The place was a mess of inhuman corpses, and even now the wax knights stood diligently, waiting for more to come. Their numbers had thinned. Some were badly injured. Hard to say. I must assume over one hundred, for the sake of surety. Annalise looked around. Neither the gate nor the walls are enchanted. Even if they were, that centaur was large enough to bound over them. And you said he brought one of the commanders from the fortresses, Durin noted. Annalise put her hands on her hips. This place was not made for defending. Only four of the wax knights are still capable of fighting, even. I have little magic left, and the wax knights are the same. We could not even heal our grave. Yet you have a plan? Durin took her off his helmet, wincing as sliced flesh stuck to it. First, destroy the host's morale, she stated plainly. We must take the corpse of the jungle and bard both, String them up above the gates. It will have little effect on the animalistic creatures. Yet the leaders are the ones we target, here. We must instill caution in them. Considering their clumsy strategy on display in this palace, they are not capable of scouting. What's the bottom line? Durin pressed, stalled desperately, Annalise admitted. Orion can turn the tide, I believe. Failing that, I am considering retreating. Either will be immensely challenging, to be sure, I may need to disobey our grave. Durin looked to the distant main palace taking a deep breath. Good gods. I never thought I'd be hoping to see that man desperately. Hash. Orion seldom fought foes that could keep up with him. His father had been one, though that had been ten years ago, and the king had never deigned to do it again. This jester, though, she could. On their first exchange Orion bullheadedly rushed in, intending to contest strength with strength. Yet the plague jester played a different game. She charged forth just as he did, yet when they neared confrontation, she darted down, sweeping his legs with the scepter in her hand. When he stepped over her blow, she planted a palm against his chest powerfully. The metal shone, bursting into sludge, and Orion staggered from the power. The plague jester darted away. He made to pursue once more, yet that sludge took the shape of a plant and thrust towards his neck. Orion caught it with one hand, quickly shattering it. When he looked at what had broken off, he saw a wooden knife. It was familiar, and memories of Magnus surfaced. Did you kill my brother? Orion demanded. The man Maitesh saw with you? I cannot say. Why not go check? The jester straightened. Orion shattered the knife in his grip discarding shards of wood. He could not determine if she was feigning innocence, though he had already been angry. He stepped forth with an icy cold and intense rage. His hand caught fire, and he thrusted it out. The plague jester stepped back, yet Orion opened his palm and shards of fiery wood flew out, pelting the plague jester. She staggered back, and Orion punched as he stepped. The jester nimbly ducked, then swung her scepter towards Orion's knee. He caught the scepter with his free hand and liquid light danced out cutting deep into his palm. He put power in his legs and kneed her in the face. She caught air for half a second before rolling gracefully and coming to a standing stop. Orion's palm bled slightly, yet soon enough the blood flowed back into his hand, and the wound slowly closed. The gods do not let me bleed, he declared, palm held forward. The plague jester stared back. Her light green nose was broken, yet she did not bleed. She fixed it with one hand. Orion pursued once again, yet as he stepped, the room burst into color. Everywhere the plague jester had touched burst forth into plant life like a spring decompressed, where her feet had stepped exploded into vines, where Orion's knee pad met her face writhed with thorny flowers, and even his own hand burst into grasping, carnivorous plants. The room became chaos at once, everything attacking Orion fiercely. His struggle was an intense surprise at first, yet then became coordinated. All he touched became flame, and he twisted about like a mongoose wrestling a cobra. Then, with a tremendous rush, he pushed past all that. The jester did not approach. This time, she danced about the room with grace. With every step that she took, the place became more and more alive. The flames grew just as quickly, Orion fanning them deliberately to free himself of his pursuit. In not seconds, the once dead throne room became unrecognizable, a jungle of biting and tearing plants, burning and growing in equal measure. Yet when the jester stepped atop one of her own roots, she winced and spasmed, shocked by electricity from one of Orion's numerous blessings. Orion took that brief moment to close the distance. A spear of ice simply formed in his hand from the moisture in the air, and he thrust it towards her with caution, giving her combat prowess ample respect. Though she attempted to deflect it, the spear broke off at the tip, creating only another spike. She pulled her head aside, yet it cut into her ear and pushed the jester hat off, 
revealing silken brown hair. With her iron close, she reached for his face. The jester succeeded only in brushing his beard, which immediately turned to plants resembling fly traps. The plants bit at his face with teeth far too sharp. As he tore them free, the jester fled once more, her bells ringing and chiming like an unspoken taunt. She ran alongside the wall, running her hand against it as she moved. Innumerable obstacles rose to meet Orion as he rushed, yet he barreled past them like an industrial machine. She wove in between the pillars holding up the ceiling changing her direction with practiced grace as she dodged around Orion. Orion could not say how much time passed. His determination never waved, and he pursued the fool as intensely as he knew how. He brought all of his blessings to heal, seeking to catch up. Yet he felt like a dog led about by the nose. Eventually, the jester came to the center of the room. The pillars, which had been still, writhed to life. Four giant wooden hummers thrust out with tremendous speed, and though Orion dodged too, he could not dodge all. One struck him into another mallet that slammed him from above. He managed to stay standing, holding up a tremendous mass of wood. He threw it up, casting it aside with his tremendous strength, and moved to catch the jester. Yet he did not foresee the ceiling collapsing. A great wave of stone and brick fell upon him. The main palace's roof had been heavily ornamented, and the great weight of all these ornaments fell upon him. The jester dodged the bulk of it. Having predicted this, and closed the distance, she jammed the sharp back of her jester scepter into his gut. It sunk deep, piercing out his back. He saw her smile. Yet Orion smiled too. Finally, he said, spitting blood. He grabbed her arm so fiercely her smile faded in not half a second. He pulled, slamming his foot into her knee so hard it bent backwards. The movement made him cough yet more blood, and he deliberately spat it into her face. Orion fell atop her, the jester's scepter still lodged in his gut. He grabbed her neck and slammed it against the stone. The granite cracked, but her head remained intact. Greenery assailed him from all sides, piercing his back, his shoulders, his arms, his neck and head. Yet Orion did nothing but slam his fist against her face time and time again. The ground cracked and dust scattered everywhere with each blow. She tried to hit him and hurt him, yet no damage deterred Orion. As his own flesh writhed into plant life and ate at him, it became a struggle simply to see who could kill who first. The plague jester's head gave into gore, and the struggle ceased. He kept slamming again and again, ensuring nothing remained. Only after a long while did he stop. Orion rose to his feet blood pouring from his mouth and staining his beard. Much of his flesh has been turned to plants from the jester's touch, now dead and wilting after her demise. Hundreds of gashes and gouges in his back tried to heal, each doing so very slowly. He fell to one knee and spat yet more blood on the plague jester's corpse. As he knelt, he caught sight of the jester's scepter still embedded into his gut. The mock head atop it made of silver still smiled up at him. He grabbed it with bloody hands and pulled it free. He stared at the scepter, doing nothing but catching his breath. Ahead, Something stirred. Orion lifted his head and stood at once. He had a hole in his gut the size of a fist, and his armor was so terribly damaged it was astounding it did not fall from his body. The golden stag rose up out of the collapsed ceiling. It struggled against trouble, rocks and debris falling from its body. Most of the flames had been suppressed by the collapse, and the greenery died with a plague jester. Orion walked forward towards the stag, his steps steady. Even now, his blood tried to make its way back inside of his body dancing through the air from various portions of the room. Ahead, the stag's golden fur turned to white ever so slowly, and its eyes regained its light. It watched Ryan as he approached. When Orion came to stand before it, expression inscrutable, its voice echoed out. Kill me, Rastsinton asked earnestly, voice old and pathetic. Orion probably did not need to be asked. He jammed the jester's scepter between its eyes, and then its legs lost its power. It collapsed into the fallen palace then turned all white. From its spot pierced into the stag's skull, the mock head atop the jester's scepter still smiled at him, half covered in a bloody handprint. Orion's gaze fell to where his uncle the Archduke sat. Orion fell to one knee. Without so much as a grunt of pain, he rose once more. His gaze turned back where he knew Argrave and the rest of the expedition was. Chapter 204 Omniscient Commander Though Annalise knew that Argrave had not explicitly given her permission to show her hand, she felt it was necessary, and she knew that he would agree. It was not so drastic a measure, of course. Indeed, exposing her druidic magic was quite a simple thing, and she had kept hidden only because Argrave was overcautious. Nonetheless, she was sure it'd be very effective. Though she had considered simply commanding everyone to hide in the buildings, that relied too much on chance. Instead, she'd be controlling things from beginning to end. As Annalise had commanded, she'd had the bodies of the jungle and the bard displayed over the gate. The giant jungle's ridiculously long ape palms were staked between two of the golden statues on the front gate and it hung with its head and part of its chest missing. The bare-faced bard's body was too badly charred to be displayed effectively, yet its face was still intact. They cut it free of the wood and hung it from a rope. It dangled like a necklace from the body of the jungle. Annalise watched the approach of the disorganized horde with her star sparrow, getting an accurate evaluation of the foe they faced. Argrave had not told her of all the entertainers in the plague jester's list, but she found it nonetheless. It stayed aback the centaur, 
taking the place of the troubadour. It was a grotesque mass of muddy roots that wound together like a ball of eels, and did not look mobile when the enemy arrived at the gates. Four of the wax knights stood in front of it, just below the massive marble archway. They confronted a host numbering probably half a thousand, yet the knights stood fearlessly. Annalise watched from a distant place, using the last of her remaining magic to control her star sparrow to oversee the situation, between the jungle and bard hanging from the gate and the obviously exposed knights before them. Anyone capable of reasoning, especially an inexperienced strategist, would suspect a trap, and that was what she wanted. Even an inexperienced commander would know a little of how to deal with a trap when there was no option but to proceed. They would not proceed blindly, they would probe, sending less important detachments to suss out what might lie ahead. When she saw the tangled mass of roots on the centaur's back call out with a strange, clicking howl, she feared what was going to happen. When the horde of enemies behind the centaur pushed back the two of them as they waited, Annalise very nearly smiled. She directed her star sparrow in front of the wax knights, giving them their signal. There was no better utility at her disposal to command them from a safe distance. The plan remained as simple as ever. Annalise was going to stall. The palace of the Archduke was a complicated complex, filled with pavilions, buildings serving many different purposes, and elaborate structures that stood as grandiose displays of wealth. Though there was a straightforward central path that led to the main building where the throne waited. The rest of the place was not so straightforward. There were winding paths that looped in on themselves, some of which looked near identical. Better yet, they were thin, hindering the coordination of large crowds. The four wax knights divided up and took different paths, with their gleaming golden armor. It was easy to keep an eye on each of the four from the sky, and Annalisa's star sparrow could maneuver quickly enough that it did not often matter if she lost track of one or more of them at a time, she could find them if only a few seconds. The creatures sent out as probes, largely dumb animals or sentinels, pursued in a disorganized if ruthless manner. Nevertheless, they were divided. Though much faster than the wax knights, Annalise had them deliberately move into thin, tight spaces like alleyways between buildings. Duran and Sylvic had their role in this. She had them lying in wait in secluded places, picking off isolated pockets of enemies when she directed them to. Gibbons armed with divinely blessed weapons would wander into an overgrown pavilion, and Sylvic would swarm up from hiding, ensnaring and ending foes with her wetland magic. Rock-hide hippos would barrel through crowded alleyways, only to be stabbed repeatedly from above by Dren's clay eye. Though a bit clumsy in light of his missing fingers, he managed the task ably enough. Though they had a set path for a time, the wax knights eventually reached the end of that road. Thus began Annalise's second duty. She guided the four knights through places that had no enemies ahead of them, like an overseer directing mice through a maze. She used her bird's tremendous speed to its fullest extent, keeping each of the four winding through the place in perfect harmony. They never confronted friend nor foe. Between guiding Duran and Sylvic to hunt foes, herding the wax knights away from danger, and keeping her eye on the mass of enemies so that none managed to get near where she hid. This task of Annalise's was a massive mental strain. There were so many variables to keep an eye on, and the simplest mistake might make anyone perish. Annalise did not know if this was because of the enchanted items Argrave had given her to help with her concentration, or simply her own personality. But she found she was very good at this. Commanding people and predicting the response of the enemy was something she had a strange, almost unnatural confidence in even despite the fact her foes were animals whose emotions she could not read, despite the urgency, despite the threat to their lives. She enjoyed doing this. Yet then, the wetland spirit and the centaur took slow, steady steps up to the gate, hooves clattering against the stone walkway leading to the gate. The centaur's gaze lingered on the bare-faced bard's head and the jolly jungle's corpse, and then scanned the palace beyond. At the same time, a great tremor rocked the whole palace complex. Annalise took her star sparrow to the sky to see the vast building that Orion and the Plague Jester fought within collapse completely. The dust was so intense she could see nothing beyond, even with the bird's fantastic eyesight. Yet when the dust fell, she saw a vast jungle rapidly growing and writhing out of the dust, so many various types of plants coming into being that it was both beautiful and horrifying. This continued for near half a minute. Then, all of the plants ceased, straining as though stretched to their limits. She could not place exactly what changed. But the vibrancy and intensity of the jungle waned before beginning to curl inwards, wilting half as quick as they had grown. The centaur stepped back, staggering as though he could not believe the sight before him. He stuck his arm through his strung bow and wore it over his shoulder, then broke into an intense gallop towards the main square. He stopped in the center, while in the distance, someone pushed past the dust. Orion emerged from the devastation. Though seeing as how devastated his body and armor were, perhaps he merely brought the devastation with him. One hand dragged along a massive white stag's body holding it by its elaborate antler crown, the other held a badly dismembered corpse by the foot, the body wearing a blood-stained motley outfit of two distinct shades of purple. I cannot be stopped, Orion declared, his voice loud and smooth. I cannot be stopped by any heretics. I will carve through your numbers piece by piece until none of you remain. My body will never tire. My mind will never waver. I'll come for you step after step, 
Day after day, night after night, the centaur trotted backwards, removing his bow from his back. The wetland spirit on his back reformed part of its body into an arrow, yet Orion heaved his body and threw the great stag's body forth. It hurtled through the air with tremendous speed, and the centaur tried to rush aside. He was not quick enough, instead, he dropped his bow and caught its antlers, sliding back from the tremendous power from the throw, hooves cracking against the uneven granite pathway. The stag's massive crown of antlers poked at his armor and flesh leaving cuts or scrapes in many places. Annalise was so awestruck by Orion's appearance and tremendous strength she nearly forgot her duties. Now that Orion is here, guide everyone to him, have him handle things. With that judgment, she made to do precisely that. Yet the wetland spirit on the back of the centaur let out its clicking howl once again, and all their enemies halted when another call came. They all frenziedly made for the walls, entirely ignoring their quarry. The animals and wetland spirit sentinels that had entered the palace complex flooded out into the wetlands with an intense desperation. The centaur retrieved his bow, and then bounded back towards the main gate. Orion stepped forth near casually, stepping atop the corpse of the great white stag he'd thrown as he watched them leave. Annalise brought her star sparrow back to her person and broke the direct connection between her and the bird. It was strange to be viewing things from her own eyes again and she took a moment to gather herself before she pushed out of the building she'd hid within to the palace, still cautious of any and all enemies, when she strode to the central square where Orion had been. The remainder of their party had already gathered. What was that? Duran questioned. They flee, like cowards, Orion said coldly. But I will come to them. They don't flee. That call, I can interpret it, Silvic interjected. They intend to marshal their forces yet more. A strategic retreat to be returned with greater numbers. Orion looked to the wetland spirit. It matters not. I will defeat all challenges. He looked around. Where is our grave? He demanded. Unconscious. He used blood magic to defeat one of the commanders, while personally dispatching the other with tremendous magical aptitude. One of the wax knights reported quickly. Unconscious. Orion repeated, finally dropping the corpse of the jester. He stepped to his knight and grabbed his shoulders. Where is he? He is safe. His guardian, Gilliman, protects him, alongside those small creatures he keeps as pets. I will go to him, take care of him, Annalise decided aloud. But Orion, all of us are drained and weary. You are needed most as a warrior and defender, she informed him curtly. He stepped up to her. He was like a radiating ball of worry and concern, so she could not muster fear. All he did was take a deep breath and nod. Yes, go to him, he said. Focus only on him. He is my brother. But he is to be your husband, so go, he directed her. The word husband left a strange feeling within her, yet she could only nod to show her assent. I will deal with the enemy, Orion stepped away. I will tear through them, as I was meant to. If they should charge me. I will flatten them. If they should flee, I will hunt them. And then, his gaze turned to Sylvic. I will decide what happens next. Sylvic displayed no fear, even though the words might ostensibly be a threat. She merely walked up to the body of the white stag and ran her uncorrupted hand against its fur. The plague will stop spreading and growing all around the world. No, it already has, Sylvic declared. I have done all I wished, washed away a stain. So you may decide as you will. Orion stared at her with his grey eyes for a few seconds. Then, he turned, battered but unbroken and proceeded towards where the enemy had fled. Chapter 204, Omniscient Commander Though Annalise knew that Argrave had not explicitly given her permission to show her hand, she felt it was necessary, and she knew that he would agree. It was not so drastic a measure, of course. Indeed, exposing her druidic magic was quite a simple thing, and she had kept hidden only because Argrave was overcautious. Nonetheless, she was sure it'd be very effective. Though she had considered simply commanding everyone to hide in the buildings, that relied too much on chance. Instead, she'd be controlling things from beginning to end. As Annalise had commanded, she'd had the bodies of the jungle and the bard displayed over the gate. The giant jungle's ridiculously long ape arms were staked between two of the golden statues on the front gate, and it hung with its head and part of its chest missing. The bare-faced bard's body was too badly charred to be displayed effectively, yet its face was still intact. They cut it free of the wood and hung it from a rope. It dangled like a necklace from the body of the jungle. Annalise watched the approach of the disorganized horde with her star sparrow, getting an accurate evaluation of the foe they faced. Argrave had not told her of all the entertainers in the plague jester's list, but she found it nonetheless. It stayed aback the centaur, taking the place of the troubadour. It was a grotesque mass of muddy roots that wound together like a ball of eels, and did not look mobile. When the enemy arrived at the gates, four of the wax knights stood in front of it just below the massive marble archway. They confronted a host numbering probably half a thousand, yet the knights stood fearlessly. Annalise watched from a distant place, using the last of her remaining magic to control her star sparrow to oversee the situation. Between the jungle and bard hanging from the gate and the obviously exposed knights before them, anyone capable of reasoning, especially an inexperienced strategist, would suspect a trap, and that was what she wanted. Even an inexperienced commander would know a little of how to deal with a trap when there was no option but to proceed. They would not proceed blindly. They would probe, 
sending less important detachments to suss out what might lie ahead. When she saw the tangled mass of roots on the centaur's back call out with a strange, clicking howl, she feared what was going to happen. When the horde of enemies behind the centaur pushed back the two of them as they waited, Annalise very nearly smiled. She directed her star sparrow in front of the wax knights, giving them their signal. There was no better utility at her disposal to command them from a safe distance. The plan remained as simple as ever. Annalise was going to stall. The palace of the Archduke was a complicated complex, filled with pavilions, buildings serving many different purposes, and elaborate structures that stood as grandiose displays of wealth. Though there was a straightforward central path that led to the main building where the throne waited, the rest of the place was not so straightforward. There were winding paths that looped in on themselves, some of which looked near identical. Better yet, they were thin, hindering the coordination of large crowds. The four wax knights divided up and took different paths, with their gleaming golden armor. It was easy to keep an eye on each of the four from the sky and Annalisa's star sparrow could maneuver quickly enough that it did not often matter if she lost track of one or more of them at a time, she could find them if only a few seconds. The creatures sent out as probes, largely dumb animals or sentinels, pursued in a disorganized if ruthless manner. Nevertheless, they were divided. Though much faster than the wax knights, Annalise had them deliberately move into thin, tight spaces like alleyways between buildings. Duran and Sylvic had their role in this. She had them lying in wait in secluded places picking off isolated pockets of enemies when she directed them to. Gibbons armed with divinely blessed weapons would wander into an overgrown pavilion, and Sylvic would swarm up from hiding, ensnaring and ending foes with her wetland magic. Rock-hide hippos would barrel through crowded alleyways, only to be stabbed repeatedly from above by Dren's clay eye. Though a bit clumsy in light of his missing fingers, he managed the task ably enough. Though they had a set path for a time, the wax knights eventually reached the end of that road. Thus began Annalise's second duty. She guided the four knights through places that had no enemies ahead of them, like an overseer directing mice through a maze. She used her bird's tremendous speed to its fullest extent, keeping each of the four winding through the place in perfect harmony. They never confronted friend nor foe. Between guiding Duran and Sylvic to hunt foes, herding the wax knights away from danger, and keeping her eye on the mass of enemies so that none managed to get near where she hid, this task of Annalise's was a massive mental strain. There were so many variables to keep an eye on and the simplest mistake might make anyone perish. Annalise did not know if this was because of the enchanted items Argrave had given her to help with her concentration, or simply her own personality. But she found she was very good at this. Commanding people and predicting the response of the enemy was something she had a strange, almost unnatural confidence in, even despite the fact her foes were animals whose emotions she could not read, despite the urgency, despite the threat to their lives. She enjoyed doing this. Yet then, the wetland spirit and the centaur took slow, steady steps up to the gate hooves clattering against the stone walkway leading to the gate. The centaur's gaze lingered on the bare-faced bard's head and the jolly jungle's corpse, and then scanned the palace beyond. At the same time, a great tremor rocked the whole palace complex. Annalise took her star sparrow to the sky to see the vast building that Orion and the plague jester fought within collapse completely. The dust was so intense she could see nothing beyond, even with the bird's fantastic eyesight. Yet when the dust fell, she saw a vast jungle rapidly growing and writhing out of the dust so many various types of plants coming into being that it was both beautiful and horrifying. This continued for near half a minute. Then, all of the plants ceased, straining as though stretched to their limits. She could not place exactly what changed, but the vibrancy and intensity of the jungle waned before beginning to curl inwards, wilting half as quick as they had grown. The centaur stepped back, staggering as though he could not believe the sight before him. He stuck his arm through his strung bow and wore it over his shoulder, then broke into an intense gallop towards the main square. He stopped in the center while in the distance, someone pushed past the dust. Orion emerged from the devastation. Though seeing as how devastated his body and armor were, perhaps he merely brought the devastation with him. One hand dragged along a massive white stag's body, holding it by its elaborate antler crown. The other held a badly dismembered corpse by the foot, the body wearing a blood-stained motley outfit of two distinct shades of purple. I cannot be stopped, Orion declared, his voice loud and smooth. I cannot be stopped by any heretics. I will carve through your numbers piece by piece until none of you remain. My body will never tire. My mind will never waver. I'll come for you step after step, day after day, night after night. The centaur trotted backwards, removing his bow from his back. The wetland spirit on his back reformed part of its body into an arrow, yet Orion heaved his body and threw the great stag's body forth. It hurtled through the air with tremendous speed, and the centaur tried to rush aside. He was not quick enough. Instead, he dropped his bow and caught its antlers, sliding back from the tremendous power from the throw, hooves cracking against the uneven granite pathway. The stag's massive crown of antlers poked at his armor and flesh, leaving cuts or scrapes in many places. Annalise was so awestruck by Orion's appearance and tremendous strength she nearly forgot her duties. Now that Orion is here, guide everyone to him, have him handle things. With that judgment, 
she made to do precisely that. Yet the wetland spirit on the back of the scent all let out its clicking howl once again, and all their enemies halted when another call came. They all frenziedly made for the walls, entirely ignoring their quarry. The animals and wetland spirit sentinels that had entered the palace complex flooded out into the wetlands with an intense desperation. The centaur retrieved his bow, and then bounded back towards the main gate. Orion stepped forth near casually, stepping atop the corpse of the great white stag he'd thrown as he watched them leave. Annalise brought her star sparrow back to her person and broke the direct connection between her and the bird. It was strange to be viewing things from her own eyes again and she took a moment to gather herself before she pushed out of the building she'd hid within to the palace, still cautious of any and all enemies, when she strode to the central square where Orion had been. The remainder of their party had already gathered. What was that? Duran questioned. They flee, like cowards, Orion said coldly. But I will come to them. They don't flee. That call, I can interpret it, Silvic interjected. They intend to marshal their forces yet more. A strategic retreat to be returned with greater numbers. Orion looked to the wetland spirit. It matters not. I will defeat all challenges. He looked around. Where is our grave? He demanded. Unconscious. He used blood magic to defeat one of the commanders, while personally dispatching the other with tremendous magical aptitude. One of the wax knights reported quickly. Unconscious. Orion repeated, finally dropping the corpse of the jester. He stepped to his knight and grabbed his shoulders. Where is he? He is safe. His guardian, Gilliman, protects him, alongside those small creatures he keeps as pets. I will go to him, take care of him, Annalise decided aloud. But Orion, all of us are drained and weary. You are needed most as a warrior and defender, she informed him curtly. He stepped up to her. He was like a radiating ball of worry and concern, so she could not muster fear. All he did was take a deep breath and nod. Yes, go to him, he said. Focus only on him. He is my brother. But he is to be your husband, so go, he directed her. The word husband left a strange feeling within her, yet she could only nod to show her assent. I will deal with the enemy, Orion stepped away. I will tear through them, as I was meant to. If they should charge me. I will flatten them. If they should flee, I will hunt them. And then, his gaze turned to Silvic. I will decide what happens next. Silvic displayed no fear, even though the words might ostensibly be a threat. She merely walked up to the body of the white stag and ran her uncorrupted hand against its fur. The plague will stop spreading and growing all around the world. No, it already has, Silvic declared. I have done all I wished, washed away a stain. So you may decide as you will. Orion stared at her with his grey eyes for a few seconds. Then, he turned, battered but unbroken and proceeded towards where the enemy had fled. Chapter 206, Fate of the Wetlands Argrave finally dared try his hand at walking once the prospect of lying in his bed began to bore him. With no books to study and only the company of his companions to keep his mind sharp, he eventually did wish to step outside and examine things. Though he stood firm, Argrave still held onto Annalise's arm in case his legs gave way. Difficult to believe I did this, he noted staring at the sight of carnage. Almost as difficult to believe you pulled off that plan of yours with only four knights at your command. It was rather skillful, on both of our ends, Annalise nodded. Argrave laughed at her unabashed confidence but did not contest the point. I can't wait to get back to the camp, see if things are working. The disease has been stayed, but it still persists in those that had it. There are ways to ward away the symptoms, regress the disease, but they're few and far between. I'll have to. He stopped. What? Annalise pressed. I was going to say, spread these methods in the southern territories. Argrave looked at the great stag's corpse, where Silvic still knelt. The fact that she's still alive. I think Orion is malleable. I think that he... He might be a better option than the rebels? Annalise finished. Argrave sighed. Didn't say that. It would definitely be an easier time. The south is poised to have a massive disadvantage once winter ends and the war begins in earnest. Ending things smoothly and quickly will save the most lives. Working with Ilnor is essential for my plans. But if I can include Orion in that equation, teach him mercy, leniency, good rule, and basic morality, steamroll the opposition, unite the continent against Gerectic Kiet, Annalise rebutted neutrally, but you would have to cooperate closely with his family. He loves Felipe, in Dune, and all the others just as much as you. It is why he is as he is. Argrave rubbed his fingers together. I know. Not to mention the ties I'd be severing, Mina, Nicoletta, Elias, and more. All of that, thrown at the foot of a holy fool in a desperate gamble that I can make him a good ruler. Frankly not too fond of religion, holiness, all that. I guess it's different, here. Gods are indisputably real. Some of them give genuine power, one of them to so right now. Argrave rubbed at his chest. The magic debt he'd accrued was the largest yet, but with the near exponential growth brought about by his black blood, he couldn't say it would take the longest amount of time to repay it. If you wish me to be honest. Annalise adjusted her arms, and Argrave, who had been leaning on her, adjusted with the movement. I view the gods like nobles or kings. They have their systems in place, and you might engage with them sometime to get what you want. Elsewise, let them be. Vade is no different, 
though do not speak a word of this to Gilliman. Argrave nodded with her words, feeling them resonate somewhat. Didn't take you for a cynic, given how calm and kind you are to most anyone. I try to show kindness to those I can relate to, Annalise refuted. It is difficult to relate to a god. She turned her head. Sylvic, perhaps, is the only one I've come near that point. What do I do? He asked her. You think about it, she told him. You've told me what must be done, and that does not change based on the side you support. We gain a reputation as minor heroes after halting the plague, we gain status by becoming high wizards in the Order of the Grey Owl, and then we work at winning Ilanor to our side. You have all this time to think, to discuss, to plan. Argrave rubbed at his face. His skin was not so smooth and unblemished, anymore. He had a scar just above his lip. I promised Orion I'd teach him things. Well, she trailed off. That is something to deal with. Postpone it, perhaps. Maintain good relations, until... A loud whistle cut through the air. Glimmon had been watching the walls, waiting for signs of Orion's return or approaching enemies. After sharing a brief glance, Annalise and Argrave slowly made to where the whistle had come from. Glimmon stepped down out of a tower that led up to the top of the wall, and they walked to him. Orion, Glimmon told them as they approached. They needed to hear nothing further. Argrave walked to the gate with slow movements, whereupon Dren and the Wax Knights joined up with them. The mist enshrouding the wetlands had grown lighter and lighter in the time that passed yet it was still sufficient to shroud the form that walked towards them. Orion emerged from the mists looking like some sort of berserker knight. He was covered in dirt, mud, and blood, and his typically braided hair was now a bushy obsidian mane that made the giant prince seem all the larger. Most of his armor had worn away, leaving him with few patches of metal atop his underclothes. Despite all of this, he still retained a strange dignity. He seemed more a conqueror than a savage. Orion walked straight to Argrave and put his hand on his shoulder. The prince had always towered over him, but now more than ever, Argrave felt like a child before him. Look at you, he said. You look half a corpse. I'll recover quickly, Argrave assured him, hoping to escape whatever Orion might suggest of him in way of treatment. I am proud to call you brother, he declared, and I hope you are proud of me. The enemy is vanquished. As many as could be, at the very least. The armored centaur escaped my grasp once again, and not because of some lapse of judgment on my part as it had been last time. I believe the jester named him. Maytesh, Argrave finished. Orion nodded. Correct. I considered pursuing, yet. He is faster than me. I do not know where he is headed. Orion finally took his hand off Argrave's shoulder. You and I must visit Uncle. Or what remains of him. In his throne room soon, discuss what must be done. Orion's grey eyes finally moved past Argrave's face, beyond into the palace. But I still have yet to pass judgment. Orion pushed past all of them, walking towards Sylvic with a determined gait. Argrave tried to move quickly to walk side by side with him, yet his legs very nearly failed him. Annalise supported him and stopped him from falling and then wordlessly helped him along. Orion, I, the prince raised one hand up as he walked. I have thought much about this, Argrave. You will watch. I do not forget your words or your actions. Which ones? Argrave thought. I hope it's not. No compromise, he considered as he hurried to catch up, looking for an opportunity to interject. Orion walked across the palace grounds, moving towards where Sylvic still leaned against the corpse of the wetland spirit Rastsintin. The plague jester's body rested off to the side, somehow spared from the ravages of decomposition as of now. The wooden wetland spirit, largely consumed by the waxpox, did not stir as Orion came to her. The prince stood above her as she sat there, body leaned up against the dead white stag. The wooden spirit's light had faded so much it appeared dim in the light of day. Orion appeared like some fell god of war come to judge Sylvic, strands of his jet black hair whipping about from a light breeze. Sylvic, a long while ago, I asked you to embrace the gods of Vasca as your own. The one you called child refused, and so I ended her. Yet now, I change my offer. The people here in these wetlands, they were wronged by our conquest. False followers of the faith came here, seeking not to spread the reach of the gods, but to expand their domains of power. Orion held his fist out and clenched it into a fist. I will not ask the people here to worship Vasca. You will take over as the shepherd of this land, leading it back into what it once was. You will teach the people of what once was here, and what was lost. Vasca will cede this land to you, utterly. So long as you, alone, devote yourself to the pantheon, the swamp folk will be given this land, and they may worship you, follow your customs. So long as you worship my gods, our gods, the gods of Vasca, our grave caught up fully with his slow pace yet did not interject both out of a sense of shock and a ponderance for what Orion said. This was a generous concession, to be sure, and one he never thought Orion would be capable of making. Sylvic lifted her head from where it rested beside the corpse of the white stag Rastsintin. She turned her face to Orion, and though most of it had been consumed by the waxpox, the liquid light in her eyes still persisted. Do you know why I fought against the plague jester? Because it stepped beyond the bounds of what we were as protectors of the wetlands, Sylvic said. She sought to wreak vengeance and misery upon all the lands of Vasca in retaliation. I opposed this, and so I was stricken as you see now. And yet, I fought alongside her and Rastsintin, 
Before all of this folly, I fought to drive Vasker out of the wetlands. I sought independence just as they had. Orion lowered his clenched fist. That can be forgiven, he told her, further surprising Argrave. This plague was not the natural order of things, Silvic said. But you of Vasca, you never had any claim to these wetlands. We have always been the people of this land ever since the dawn of time. Thousands of other spirits before me have tended to this land, protected its people. Your ancestors stormed in driven by greed and slaughtered my friends, ruined my children, and made this place but a genocidal footnote in Vasca's history. Now, you seek to give it back to us? It was never yours to give, she said, voice echoing throughout the palace. Orion placed his hand against his hip, jaw clenched tight in restraint. You act the merciful saint but I do not trust you. You speak of never resting until any and all heretics are wiped out. To that I say this, I fought against the plague. Oh yes, I did. But just as you killed my comrades, my lover, my children, I am glad your uncle has become as he is. I am glad your brother, Magnus, had that knife driven through his neck. Nothing brought me greater joy than looking upon his corpse, and, Orion's boot slammed down upon her face. He stomped again and again, yelling and screaming in rage. Argrave stepped back fearfully, yet soon enough the rage turned to sorrow and Orion stood there shouting defiantly at a corpse, tears streaming down his face. He fell to his knees, crying into the cold, shattered granite pathway beneath him. No one seemed able to move besides Orion. He cried there for minutes, body shuddering as he slowly subsided into mute sobs. After what felt like time eternal, he stopped shaking. He finally lifted his body up straight and stared up at the sky above. Argrave, Orion said, voice dead. We must go see our uncle. The idea paralyzed him with fear after that vicious display of emotion. Argrave stayed silent for a few moments, then said, I'm still quite weak, I'll need to trouble you. Orion stood and walked towards him. Annalise handed him off hesitantly. Ever so slowly, he and Argrave walked towards the distant main palace, where a wilted jungle of browning greenery and stone awaited them. Chapter 207 Departing Changed Argrave walked to the site of the tremendous battle between Orion and the Plague Jester the prince supporting him as he walked, seeing the devastation wrought here was like a reminder of his powerlessness before Orion, decay and destruction surrounded him on all sides, the smell of flowers fortunately masked the scent of gore emanating from Orion, he's here, Orion finally said, just before the wilting jungle opened up to reveal a staircase up to a throne room, they stepped over rubble and low-lying plants, and then came to stand at the foot of the staircase, a man sat on the throne, he had all the hallmarks of Vasca ancestry, obsidian black hair, stony eyes, and a formidable presence. His son sitting just behind him inherited some of that, while his blonde wife must have had no relation other than marriage. They were strangers to Argrave. Their deaths were inevitable in the game, and Argrave did not think he'd be able to reverse whatever magic had them in its hold. The magic at play was too powerful for Ebon Ice, and he did not have other means at hand. He could see the faint rise and fall of their chests as they breathed, but otherwise, they seemed totally dead. Uncle Regine was assumed dead. No expeditions sent into the wetlands returned so that theory was never confirmed, Orion mused, he used to, tell me stories about the water take this place, I remember, I thought he was a model faithful, thought, Argrave noted, Orion started to step up the stairs ever so slowly, leading Argrave along with more consideration than Argrave thought he'd receive, after observing this place, observing the people that lived here, doing more than merely fixate on the act of spreading the faith, as I always have, I concluded that my uncle did not come here with a faith in mind, Orion looked up at the Archduke. Even when I think back, I never once recall him mentioning the gods. Orion and Argrave reached the top of the stairs. Now that the gesture is dead, they are not sustained, he noted. They've begun to die. Can you think of a way to save their lives? No, Argrave said honestly. He took his arm off Orion's and came to stand on his own. His legs still felt weak, but he could manage for now. Orion nodded. He stepped before the throne and knelt. Uncle, I am unsure if you hear me, know me. The prince placed his hand to his chest. The enemy is defeated. Those that wronged you are dead and gone. Their uncle gave no response. He simply kept staring at nothing with his dry, dead gray eyes. Orion stared back for what must have been a full minute. Then, with a resigned sigh, he rose to his feet. I will not burden you by asking for your help. I will be the one to deliver uncle home, Orion said to Argrave, though it pains me. Returning with all of their bodies at once will be difficult. I would not put that burden on you or your companions nor would I carry them haphazardly and stain their bodies with poor handling. I will bring uncle. I will have to send men to retrieve them after we return. Perhaps they can be saved by those more learned than you or I. Argrave doubted it. But he said nothing. Orion stepped up to him. Have you considered my offer further? To help you build a religious institution for the country? Argrave questioned. Yes, Orion nodded. This expedition affirmed my choice tenfold, one hundredfold. Orion declared boldly, then paced away. We need a true arm of the gods on this world. You and I. We are of the blood of the royal family. Who else should the role fall upon but the divinely anointed representatives of the gods? I am baseborn, Argrave pointed out, stalling for time as he thought of his real answer. By law, but the king, our father, 
is law, your status may change. You have the light of the gods within you, our grave. Your feats here have shown me that no other of my brothers are as committed to righteousness and goodness as you are, as much as it chagrins me to say so. Orion put his hand on his hip and shook his head. As our grave stared at the man who was now his brother, covered in gore and seemingly unharmed after fighting against dreadful enemies for days on end, he confronted his feelings and thought subjectively. He scares me, our grave noted. I can't ever be at ease around him. He's easily manipulated, and he might be taught how to be genuinely good. But he is so volatile and impulsive, I don't think I could ever be fully comfortable near him. I don't like Vasca as a whole. Orion won't ever betray Vasca, I don't think. When Felipe dies. Indeed, if things remain as they were in Heroes of Berinda, and the king does actually die, our grave might be able to put Orion on the throne. In Dune was a main barrier to that, a barrier that would need to be broken regardless. He might try and negotiate with the Margrave, and this civil war with minimal bloodshed. Then, there would be a strong leader at the helm of Vasca, more than able to confront Gerectic Kiet's many trials surfacing in the coming years. The task was ridiculously beyond what Argrave felt he was capable of. It sounded like a delusional fantasy even as he thought of it. Argrave's role in the civil war would not be active. Ilnor was the most important party in the whole thing, if he gained her support, the whole situation could be upended. She was a schemer and strategist beyond reproach. With her help, she might make such a thing happen. And yet Argrave was not sure she would be amenable to the idea. And still, Argrave found he could not deny Ryan outright. Even if he could not achieve this perfect solution to all of Vasca's troubles, if he could create a force for good on the side of the royalists. If he could make Orion see the error of wanton bloodshed and mindless crusading. Shouldn't he take that opportunity? Wasn't it the right thing to do? The question was enough to make his head explode, yet Argrave felt he had an answer. Dot this idea of yours is in its infancy, Argrave said slowly and deliberately, as though each word might cost him his life. I promised you I'd teach you. Teach you about my ways, about my methods, about a way to deal with things that doesn't call for mindless violence, as we saw here in these wetlands. Argrave nodded. I'd like to stick to that, and along the way. We can plan more about the future. For us, and for Vasca. For the faith. Orion brightened and stepped forward. He looked like he wished to crush Argrave, but then held himself back. I would embrace you, were you not so weak. Presently, he said eagerly. I have some things to take care of. First, Argrave held his hand up. Annalise and I will be registered as High Wizards of the Order. Pragmatism slipped back into his brain, and he questioned, but... You mentioned better outfitting Glimmon with enchanted gear. Indeed, Orion nodded. I must pay a visit to royal blacksmiths regardless, as you can plainly see, he pointed to his tattered armor with a hearty laugh. Do you think? You might have the armoring done quickly, delivered to that town not too far from the Tower Kin's End, I think it was called, where acolytes officially abandon their noble name when studying at the Tower, and, well, even Fedron, and his equipment. Our grave dead pushes limits, absolutely, if I have my way and you are named Prince well and truly. I can think of no more fitting candidates for your first two royal knights. Orion pounded his chest. Once we arrive back at camp, I will see that it is done immediately. There will surely be some armorers among the refugees that might take their measurements, and then I will have that delivered to the royal armorers and enchanters. Argrave was somewhat surprised how easy that request had gone. And weapons? Naturally, Orion nodded. Suddenly, Argrave did not feel so weak anymore. He was vaguely tempted to ask his brother for all of his gold, but he was afraid the answer might be yes which reminded him. Then everything is settled. We should leave soon, Argrave said. Tomorrow, perhaps? Indeed, Orion nodded once again. Argrave turned his head away, almost feeling like he was in a dream. He'd have another task for his companions, robbing this luxurious palace of anything that might be worth anything during the night. It was a thankless task, but Argrave felt somewhat jealous of them. His task was all the more dangerous. His task would be distracting Orion while they did so. Hash. They left the next morning. Three of the wax knights remained in Archduke Regine's palace, mostly to ensure the Archduke's family was not disturbed until they could be retrieved. The palace was a harrowing place as ever, and somehow made drearier by the jester's death. Orion severed Rastsintin's stag head and carried it with him, a proof of conquest. It was somewhat brutal, but Argrave supposed it was better than returning empty-handed and claiming they'd saved the world. The journey was slow moving to accommodate Argrave, a fortunate thing too, because it made the pounds of jewelry in his companions' packs clink less as they traveled. They lacked Silvic's protection, but with the plague jester's death, it was no longer necessary. No powers held a grip over the region anymore. It was as harmless as any land they'd traversed in the past, barring some few nasty creatures. Once they left the parts that had been consumed by waxpox, it seemed almost ordinary. Argrave had resolved to remain at the abandoned keep Orion had made his camp and rest, at least for a day. He felt, for the first time, there wasn't some looming threat above that demanded he take things two steps at a time at all times. He could relax, eat some terrible swamp food, read some dull spellbooks, and enjoy the company of his companions. Then, 
he dove into the heart of things with a clear mind. After four days of utterly exhausting travel, Argrave saw rows upon rows of tents. He let Orion take the lead, because he was sure that the people would shower him in praise and cheers. His part would be remembered, to be sure. But he was not the one who had done the most. He did not deserve the accolades as much as Orion, nor did he especially want them. Things went as expected when they returned. A few noticed Orion with a towering stag head on his back, and then the crowd snowballed from there. After explaining that the disease had not been cured, but it would cease spreading, Orion gave a grandiose speech which Argrave was too tired to remember. This speech eventually culminated in a crowd cheering his name. Yet then Argrave himself was dragged to the front, pale and exhausted. Orion raised his arm up in the air and spoke of his deeds. The prince spoke of how Argrave spilled his blood to kill the enemy, and nearly died to dispatch foul enemies and heretics. And then, they cheered his name, as he listened to the cheers of, Argrave, 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 and Bastard of Vasca, Bastard of Vasca. His tired and exhausted mind had some difficulty processing it. He was mostly waved around like a puppet by Orion, accepting his praise half-heartedly. For the longest time, he had always thought of crowds of people as an enemy. Certainly, the confrontation with Titus had exacerbated that. He'd used a crowd against them. And yet, he'd done something good, and people had recognized that. He certainly hadn't done it for the recognition. Having a good reputation with people was something he wanted, not for the sake of accolades, but because it'd make his job easier in the future. Overwhelmed, Argrave did his best to get away from the crowd as soon as possible. As he laid in bed, leaving the logistics of things to Annalise because of his exhaustion. People are fickle, Argrave thought. But I guess I like them. Chapter 208, Rising Tension in Rest. You said we would rest, noted Drun, though he did not complain as he put the white books written by Garm back into his backpack. He fumbled a little on account of his missing fingers, which made Argrave feel guilt once again. We will, Argrave confirmed, resting off to the side while Gilliman packed his things for him accommodating his weakened state. We'll take a nice, long rest, believe me, my legs ache much worse than yours, and I want to rest. But half the damn continent knows or will know we're in this camp, and I don't care to be a sitting duck so that Indu nor anybody else comes here and ruins my day. We'll go to a secluded place without any watching eyes. He turned his gaze to Annalise. Speaking of, there's something I want you to do. Alert Mina, have her get away from Indune she guessed. Argrave smiled. If only everyone could guess my plans as well as you. That might be a problem, actually. Duran shook his head. Might make future deceptions a bit more difficult. Argrave chuckled but said nothing. Alerting Mina will not take long. Half an hour, perhaps, she nodded, and her star sparrow jumped to her finger. I've already told Orion we're leaving. He's to return to the capital, put affairs in order, get some stellar armor for the two of you to wear, and then rejoin us at Kin's End. I don't plan on traveling again until I'm fully prepared to defend myself. I've earned something of a reputation, and all my brothers are trigger happy. Moreover, I'll need a B rank spell to demonstrate to the Order of the Grey Owl that isn't blood magic. Ancient, forgotten blood magic, at that part of the advancement process to a high wizard, you see. Annalise seemed the most pleased by this news. She was the one constantly encouraging him to take a rest, and stop using blood magic, now. He promised to do both. Argrave stood. I know a place, small village, maybe six houses, doesn't receive travelers often, and the residents leave less often. We pay them a few gold, they'll shine our shoes and feed us grains, I'm certain but it's a safe place to hole up, and that's all I need. He looked to Annalise, but first, I will send the star sparrow out, she finished. Hash. Another day without more deaths, nor registered refugees, Indune noted, staring down at a document. Mina, standing across from him on the death, tried to read the document upside down in vain. It seems we're doing well. It felt strange for Mina to hear the words we coming from the crown prince of the kingdom of Vasca. She could not deny she had been dreadfully apprehensive about this task that Argrave had given her. Rumors of the crown prince's temper and cruel tendencies persisted in every territory from the Parban Margravate in the far south to the vast forests of the Archduchy of Corsair, furthest north in Vasca. Mina could not deny that Prince Anduin was brilliant. She had spent near two weeks with him by this point tending to the refugee and plague problem in Vedan and beyond. He had a natural affinity for management and rulership. He was adept at predicting how people would act, and how to force people to act. He had an astonishing aptitude with numbers, and anything that entered his memory did not leave it. He could keep track of innumerable factors at once, always maintaining a full picture of any scenario and thereby generating a solution that matched. But the prince was limited, sorely limited. In Dune only knew fear and punishment. He would prefer to uproot a dying plant and put something new in its place instead of simply changing the way it was tended to. There were no half measures with him. Though he could see the merit in other methods, and could apply them if pressed, he never went for bloodless solutions. Part of it was habit, Mina suspected. The other part? She supposed he simply enjoyed ruthless methods more. The disease doesn't subside, Mina noted. We have to keep working at it until people start to get better. Thus far. She had managed to avoid his temper by staying businesslike. Despite the rumors of his temper, 
He did not lash out at her when she suggested other methods. She wondered if they were over-exaggerated, or if she was simply doing something right. You're right. The disease doesn't subside, Indune said. Same phrase, different meaning. Those that catch it won't lose it. It's a permanent affliction, this waxbox. Indune stood up straight until he towered over Mina. That's why they must be killed. It's the only solution. Surely you see that? You have no evidence for that. She pushed back. Something golden moved in the corner of her eye, but she didn't dare glance away from Indune. There has been not one report of a single recovery, Indune noted, half mockingly. But indeed, I have no evidence they will not recover. I suppose we must wait for everyone to fall sick and die before we take action. Surely one of them will recover. He laughed. As he reared back his head in laughter, Mina caught sight of another golden flash. She dared glance away whereupon she spotted a beautiful golden bird by the window. She was prepared to dismiss it from her mind, too occupied with the temperamental prince to pay attention to a pretty sparrow. Then, she thought back. That's Annalise's bird, she noted, and as her eyes tracked it, she noticed its action were far too deliberate in drawing her attention to be those of a simple-minded creature. I must visit the privy, Mina declared, standing up, and Dune stared down at her. A very unladylike declaration, he derided. Why do you tell me? Just go. Mina did not need to be told more than once. She kept herself from sprinting only because of her company. She opened the door, passing by the royal guards and Dune had stationed outside, and entered the courtyard of the castle. She made to a secluded place, whereupon she glanced up at the sky, waiting. The bird appeared before her as though it had always been there, and Mina's head jumped back involuntarily. Once the bird settled on her arm, staring up at her, she questioned in a low whisper, Our grave succeeded? The bird nodded. It was a rather adorable action, Mina thought, but the topic was too serious for her to act upon it. The reason that the waxpox had not spread at all the past while was because Argrave had stopped it, she was certain. I can go? She confirmed in paranoia, to which the bird nodded again. At that, Mina took a deep breath and sighed. Tell Argrave that his debt is tenfold what he imagined, she told the bird. Maybe it was her imagination, but it looked amused before simply vanishing. It must have been some sort of magical bird she suspected. Where to go? Mina mused. I'll not stick around here once and Dune learns the news. Argrave will surely be leaving. As the answer came to her, she took a deep breath. South. The Margravate, perhaps. Safest place, I'm sure. With no further thought, she left. Hash. Orion gazed out at the refugee camp. Though the people afflicted with the waxpox still persisted, it caused no more deaths. The steady trickle of refugees seeking his blessing thinned every day. And though he was less busy because of it, he was glad to be less busy. A convoy had already left, bearing many of his instructions and the messages for people at the capital in Dirica. Soon enough, he would be joining them, though he had put it out of his mind while focusing on this task. There was much for him to learn of. He knew naught of this rebellion beyond the fact that it existed, yet rebelling against the divine anointed royal family. This matter must be resolved, yet followers of the faith were not meant to slaughter followers of the faith. He saw no way to proceed without bloodshed, and yet, our grave might. He had some of Ilnor's cleverness when she had been younger and the more vibrant, not crippled as she was now. He still did not understand why she had to be harmed in such a way, yet it was his father's decree. Orion would tend to the duties as a prince of Vasca and consult his brother our grave for advice. His family was the most important thing to him. All of his many parents, his brothers, his sister, Yet they were not without issue. There might be mended. Someone stepped up to Orion as he was lost in thought and knelt before him. He wore heavy burlap robes, mud-stained and battered by fast travel. My prince, the man sat, panting. What is it? Orion questioned, not ungently. The man held his hands up, not daring to look at his face. He held a parchment, some minor enchantments on its surface protecting it, standard practice of the royal family's messages. Orion took it from Prince in Dune. If it please you, I deliver this to you on his behalf. Orion pulled free the binding with his big fingers, then read through the document. It took him a long time to read through it all, yet once he did, he lowered it and helped the man before him to stand. My brother sent you? Orion questioned, his tone cold. He gripped the man by the shoulders so firmly he seemed liable to pop. The man looked scared, but he answered, Yes, my prince, yes he did. Why is he in Vedden? Why does he wish to see me? Orion demanded. As to that, I, I could not say, my prince. The man said hastily, I am but a servant to the Count Elgar of Vedden. One of Indune's royal knights pulled me aside, demanded I deliver this. Orion narrowed his eyes. Did you see my brother himself? Why yes, my prince. He has been in Vedden for some time, now, dealing with the influx of refugees and preventing its spread. My prince, the man added was once again, as a show of respect. Orion finally released the man's shoulders. He patted him on the shoulders. You were a good man to bring this to me. He commended loudly. Here take this. He shoved five gold coins into the man's hand, and then stepped around him. Without another word, Orion had a bright smile on his face, white teeth barely showing past his black beard. And Dune, of all my brothers, helping to curb the plague, I knew I was not misguided. I knew the gods had a plan for all of us. I must tell him of Magnus, 
and of Argrave's triumph. It is not too late for our family. Chapter 209 Softly, Argrave set down his backpack and sat in the guest bed that had been offered to them. Dust jumped up off it. But Argrave could hardly be bothered by dust anymore considering all that he'd endured. Annalise sneezed. He thought it was a cute sound, and Argrave found himself staring at her. She wiped away her nose, oblivious to him as she examined the room. Unused for a time. Yet it seems sturdy enough that I have no worries. The people here hate me. Me and Gilliman, I suppose. They only allowed us to stay because of our generous payment. And our weapons. Hearing that made Argrave frown. There's perhaps twenty people in this town, and they go to a big city maybe once a year he reasoned. I suppose elves are as mythical and as feared as dragons to them. Nothing will bother us, here. We can rest and recuperate, enjoy an idyllic life. For a couple weeks, maybe. They were in the largest house in this small town. The only resident was an old widow, whose children had all left the village or built houses of their own elsewhere. Duran and Gilliman had their own room just nearby. The widow was the only one who didn't seem to be highly suspicious of his elven companions. Argrave's Brumasoners started to sneeze, too, and he laughed. Perhaps we should dust up. Annalise suggested. Absolutely, Argrave rose to his feet. Once Argrave began cleaning again, he remembered how much he enjoyed doing it. He was very methodical in his approach, and before long the place was noticeably brighter, freed from a blanket of grey lying atop it. Once that was done, the two of them sat there on the bed in silence. Only crickets, endless plains of winter grass in most directions. No noises, no distractions, Annalise mused. I like places like this. Argrave thought about it, soaking in the quietude. It does have its charms he conceded. But I still like big cities the best. Constant noise, always drowning things out, distracting. He paused, taking in the sounds. Or lack thereof, he supposed. In time, his gaze found Annalise again. Of course. If you're with me. That's a constant distraction. Can't stop my eyes from wandering to you. Annalise scoffed half-heartedly and looked at him with affection. No, there was something a little bit more intense that just affection between them. He took off one glove and put a hand to her cheek. It wandered across her cheeks, her lips and then down her neck until her hand rose up to meet his. She held it close to her chest. It's nice and quiet, Argrave said, and we have plenty of time. His fingers fiddled with a strap on her leather armor. Argrave, she said quietly, yet there was some nervous excitement in her voice. Her amber eyes stayed fixed on his hand. I know we agreed it was a bad idea. But sometimes I'd like to have a bad idea. Or two, he said suggestively. Her eyes finally lifted from his hand to his eyes. You're unwell. I'm perfectly capable. Argrave stared back at her. Annalise held his gaze for a long time, as though deliberating on something, with a swallow. She said quietly, I think. It should be fine, now. It is a safe time. Argrave raised a brow. Yeah? Yes. Annalise nodded, leaning closer to him. She took her hand off of his and moved it towards him. Music to my ears, he whispered, before leaning in to meet her. It was a gentle and soft kiss. They slowly fell back into the bed, growing more emboldened in every passing second. Their hands wandered naturally completely in tune with each other now as they always were. Indeed, it was a quiet night. Gilliman took Duran out of the house, ensuring they remained on the porch with the old widow. Argrave's Brumasoners curled in the corner of the room, the star sparrow using them like a nest. And like that, it became a night without distractions. Hash. The morning came as it always did. There were no windows in the room they'd been given, but Argrave felt things were a little brighter nonetheless. His Brumasoners curled around the star sparrow, shielding it from the elements. Their fur was a dark grey. Now, the creatures had eaten many souls without an excessive expenditure. The bird nested in their fur as though it was natural. Argrave stared down at Annalise, half covered in their blanket as she leaned up against him. The blanket could not fully cover either of them and the bed was a bit too small for Argrave. Yet despite these annoyances he felt well rested. Maybe she had already been awake, or maybe they were simply in tune, but Annalise lifted her head up to look at him. Despite the exhaustion in their eyes, it seemed like neither could stop themselves from smiling, both grinning like fools. Good morning. Annalise greeted him. That's never been truer, Argrave agreed. She chuckled and buried her face on his chest. Argrave stroked her long white hair, enjoying her warmth in the early morning chill. He was tired. It was a good exhaustion, though. We cannot make a habit of this, she said. Chapter 210, Privilege of the Younger. I'm sure that she'll turn up sooner or later, my prince. That child, Mina, she's. Count Elgar of Vedden shook his head. Indune tapped his fingers against the dining table, staring Elgar down with his cold blue eyes. The Count had golden hair and eyes just as Mina did yet shared little with her beyond that. Indune did not like him. Your daughter is missing, yet you don't seem to care. Elgar placed his elbows on the table and clenched his hands together. She's been doing that since she was very young, my prince. She'll disappear for days, sometimes weeks on end. Typically I need only send a message to Duke and Rico. She always heads the... The foolish girl. I apologize for her discourtesy. Indune narrowed his eyes. Though anger was there, something else marred his features more. Confusion, perhaps 
or curiosity. You've not sent her away? Elgar raised a brow. Why would I do that, my prince? Stupidity, maybe. And Dune mused leaning back in the chair and scratching his temple. Count Elgar clenched his jaw tightly at the insinuation yet did not rise to combat it. Do you hate your daughter, I wonder? Elgar furrowed his brows. Who would hate their child? Well, my father, for one, he never liked me much. I killed his wife, you know. The whole childbirth incident, Indune pointed out. Both looked serious, but then Indune started to laugh. Joking, joking. Of course, of course. Indune smiled widely. Mina is missing, Prince Indune. I don't know what else to tell you, Elgar stated once again leaving no room for argument, and Dune leaned back in and slammed his hand against the table. Yet you send not a single night to look for her? Elgar stared back. I have explained my reasonings. That girl had wasted enough resources in frivolous searches throughout her whole life. The wax pox still abounds, and I'll not have my guards contract it in a fruitless quest to collect her. And Dune's gaze was cold and dead. Elgar swallowed as they stared at each other, alone in the dining hall. Just then, the great double doors burst open, and Dune turned his head surprised. The confidence in his posture veritably withered away as his eyes widened. Brother! Orion shouted out cheerily, moving towards Indune with long strides. The prince wore thin casual clothes, rich and black, yet even still he made the formidable Indune look small. Indune rose to his feet and stepped back, placing the chair between himself and his brother. Orion, why are you? Here? Orion pushed the chair aside with his foot and embraced Indune. The elder prince's face visibly contorted in displeasure and anxiety and his hands hovered a fair distance away as though he feared to touch his brother. Prince Orion pushed away, holding Indune by the shoulders. I've heard of what you've been doing here, working with the sick, stopping the plague from spreading. I cannot describe the joy that welled within once I heard of it. It brought tears to my eyes, and seeing outside. You have done so well. Indune swallowed. He never knew what to say when he talked with Orion. He always did his best to avoid his younger brother. He never felt older when they spoke. He always felt deeply uncomfortable almost belittled, after any interaction with him. Indune tried to avoid his father, too, though never for the same reasons. How did you get in? Count Elgar inquired. I did not hear the guards open the gate. Orion released Indune and turned, expression and tone cold. I climbed the walls. I trust this is no problem, Count Elgar. The royal family is not barred from anywhere in the lands of Vasca, and I wished to visit with my brother. On that note, give us some time, he directed the Count curtly. The Count looked as disconcerted as Indune felt. He gave a stiff bow and made to leave. Orion's stern gaze followed his every step, making the Count hurry. He shut the doors behind him. As though his sternness was a facade, he turned to Indune happily. I wished to speak with you daily. Of course, I always enjoy speaking with my family, yet now it was especially so. There is so much to speak of, so much to do. It has been too long since we last spoke, brother. We must change that in the future. Why are you here? Indune reiterated insistently. Orion raised a brow. You wished me to come. Did you not? Ah, but, even if you did not, I wished to talk to you. Let us begin. Orion pulled a chair back and sat, facing away from the table. Dot with the more dire news. Our brother, Magnus, was murdered in cold blood. Indune took a mental note of everything Orion said and stepped forth cautiously. So close to you, I hear, he said, implying negligence. I know, Orion said, and at once broke into tears. He placed his elbow on his knee as his hand supported his face, tears of molten silver pouring between the cracks of his fingers. I was foolish. My brother died not minutes away from me, and I was entirely ignorant. The thought will haunt me for time eternal. And Dune watched the molten silver tears smoke and burn the Count's carpet once they fell. His brother's strange tendencies and constant oddities were a large part of Indune's discomfort at his presence. But I am near sure we have caught his killers, Orion continued voice now filled with an icy anger. Foul things persisted in the wetlands. I have finally ventured deep within them, and I have discovered the truth of the fall of the Archduchy. Orion rose up. Foul beings with vengeance in their hearts wreaked havoc across the wetlands. And then, the entire continent. Their magic killed Magnus, I am sure of it, but I killed them. Killed them all to the last. Extinguished them with my bare hands. Indune stared at Orion's hands as he clenched them into fists. This plague. The heretics of the wetlands caused it, Orion growled. Thousands of lives burnt, scarred or simply withered away entirely by their revolting rage. But I, no, that is not fair to say. Argrave recognized this. Argrave put a stop to the plague. Prince in Dune's vision swirled. What? He asked, low and insistent. Perhaps you've noticed the spread has ceased, Orion ventured. Argrave found out the rout cause. He heralded a traitor, used her to put an end to this virulent vendetta. And now, the disease will never spread again. What are you talking about? Indune demanded, voice tense. Orion held his hands out. A non-believer and would-be slaughterer called the plague just to harness the power of the wetland gods to conjure and spread this plague all across the land. Argrave tore this information from the hands of an enemy, and then led a crusade forth by my side to vanquish the enemy. Vanquish the enemy? Indune laughed twice. His vision was all white as myriad emotions assaulted him from the news. Before he realized it, 
He was stepping away from Orion, heading to where he and Mina had planned out their tackling of the plague. As soon as it was brought up, Indune knew it had to be true. The fact that the waxpox had not spread at all in a week was such a bizarre thing. It had struck him as odd the first day he'd seen it. He thought it mere luck. Yet this strange happening persisted. He remembered wondering if, perhaps, Mina had been right all along. He wondered if he could rule in this manner. He made it to Mina's study and leaned out across the balcony, gazing out at all of the work he'd put in the past few weeks. Innumerable tents, messages, edicts, all to curb the plague. And all that overshadowed by Argrave's grand achievement. All of his efforts entirely wasted. He would receive nothing in return for it. No recognition. No praise. Mina, in Dune reflected. She's Argrave's friend. And now she's gone. She was strangely insistent I stay here. In Dune gripped the stone railing tightly enough to hurt his hands. He turned back to the desk, over which he and Mina had drafted out plans for days on end. He stepped to the table, fists clenched, wishing to take his anger out on something. It was all a lie. He thought, his breathing heavy. But then he paused. He looked at a half-finished piece of writing, and then reflected. No. No, something is off, his mind noted. She worked as hard as I did. She was desperately attempting to stop the plague in Veden and beyond. Those were not the actions of someone who knew it was to end. And Dune lifted his head, his breathing growing steady, and her departure. It was soon before Orion arrived. None saw her leave, and even her further is ignorant. What's more, I was never informed of this victory. Ilnor has eyes everywhere, if she wished to inform me urgently she could. She wanted me to return to the capital not weeks ago. Now she keeps me ignorant. Endune turned his head back as Orion entered the room once more. Endune took slow, steady steps towards him. Endune. What's wrong? Why did you storm off? So, you said I wanted to see you earlier, Endune said, his voice surprisingly calm. What gave you that impression? Orion raised his brows, then thought back. You sent a messenger to the northwest, no? Endune smiled. Me, personally, or someone under my command? Someone under your command, Orion reflected brows furrowed, I believe. A royal knight, the man said. In Dune took a deep breath, his smile widening. He laughed in revelation. Everything seemed to fit together so well. I see, I see. Yes, I see it now, he said. And then began laughing once more. Orion looked confused. Did you not? Oh, I did. In Dune lied heartily, for the first time feeling glad of his brother's presence. His sister had likely deliberately sent Orion here to rattle him, make him emotional. Make him do something impulsive. Tell me, do you know where our grave is heading? Orion answered proudly. After I head to Dirica, I intend to petition my father for legitimization. Regardless of the result, we planned on meeting him at Kin's End. He has asked I deliver some armor and weaponry to his companions. I intend on outfitting them with equipment from the Royal Armory. And Dune pursed his lips at the mention of legitimization. Petition father. Well, ending the plague is a meritorious achievement. Well worthy of something like that. I am pleased you agree. Orion concurred happily. He is a changed man, a B-rank mage, seeking to become a high wizard of the order. Him and his fiancée, a lovely woman, his companion, incredibly smart, resourceful, true love blossoms between them. And Dune raised his brows, and then stepped up to Orion. He prodded his chest twice. I'll tell you what, Further has been quite upset at your absence, you know. I suspect he will not be so pleased if you come back to the capital and then leave so quickly. And Dune stepped away, retrieving a document. I will give my magic signature to a document advising our grave be legitimized. While you persuade father, comfort him with your presence. I will deliver the royal armory's equipment to our grave. Orion frowned. Yet I promised I would meet our grave there. You can. And Dune held his finger out. But I'd like to meet him first. Let me tell him how proud I am. I think it would be best you spend a fair amount of time at Derica with father. Even if he doesn't say so, he sorely misses you. Certainly. If it's only a few days, I am sure our grave would not mind if our meeting is delayed. Doubly so if you explain things. Orion took a deep breath. Oh, and tell no one. Absolutely no one, Indune coaxed quietly. I wish to surprise our dear brother. A surprising reunion is all the more joyful, no? Like this reunion, surprising, joyful, and very, very enlightening. About the true nature of my family members, Orion looked pleased. That sounds like a wonderful plan, Indune. Come here, Indune said initiating a hug for the first time he could recall. As his head rested beside Orion's, he smiled. He thought back to Mina's words. A well-maintained tool performs a task all the better. If you like this audiobook, subscribe the channel for more videos like this. And join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks. Hurry up, what are you waiting for? Leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook, I will be happy to create them for you. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.